This is The First Stop, a podcast with the aim of exploring the minds of artists in and around New Haven. In this episode, we'll navigate the mind of New Haven-based artist Kat Balco. The works discussed in this podcast can be found on our blog at firststopart.com. Kat's colorful, mandala-like paintings suggest centripetal motion and radiate energy. They're thrilling to look at as beautiful abstractions, and at closer viewing, her abstract paint strokes appear to have depth due to her subtle use of shadow, a skill she developed from her time as a trompe l'oeil painter. And they start to feel like depictions of objects or environments that can't quite be placed. Her paintings call to mind a disparate array of associations that seem somehow to be connected, such as stars, suns, industrial machinery, instruments of torture, carnival wheels, female genitalia, religious iconography, and more. Welcome to the first stop. Thanks for dropping by. We're really excited to have you, Kat. I'm excited to be here. Awesome. I was looking at your work online, and I actually, I watched your Gorky's granddaughter oh from 2010. Yeah, that's a long time yeah. ago. Looking at your, your work today, right, you have these, you have these really interesting mandala uh, forms um, that you seem to be associating with uh, industry mm -hmm. um, and sort of family lineage and the industry of Connecticut. And I noticed um, from 2010, looking at what you were working on then, you had the big weaving mm -hmm. um, works that I think they were 90 feet long. Mm -hmm. I was looking at them uh, online this morning and I suddenly started thinking about weaving and I actually asked my wife, who's an Americanist and right. studied, you know, the history of weaving. And I was wondering if you were thinking about back then, thinking about these weaving forms in the context of industry. Mm -hmm. Like, were you thinking about industrial weaving? Because it is kind of both a sort of personal. There are things that are like hand woven and then there are things that are woven in factories. And... Yeah, it's funny. I think the I've always this is a long answer to that question, but I've always felt that the process of growing as an artist is more of a digging and uncovering and revealing than mm -hmm. a kind of building up or at least for me building up and adding. And so I think much of what I'm doing is unconscious. And my job is to kind of bring that into consciousness and try to figure yeah. out like why I'm interested in the things I'm interested in. I feel like some of the best advice I got as a student was just take care of your affections, <laughs> follow the yeah. things that you like. And um, that long piece that you're talking about, you know, I made it because it seemed like it would be fun to make. I, I used a small form and then repeated it and generated this big weaving, wall weaving. It was in this industrial space in West Cove, which doesn't exist anymore, that old I artist space, which was such a cool yeah, place. Such and a cool place. No one really bothered me. I was allowed to just work on that for like four months inside this. That's amazing. Yeah. Who who gets who yeah. gets an eighty you know an eighty foot wall to work on for four months right. kind of lackadaisically. You know, yeah. was great. So <laughs> the um that project to me it's was sort of the allure of the space. It was winter, it was freezing, of course it was unheated. And that working at that large scale. So while I wasn't I, I wasn't consciously thinking about industry, I was in fact in an industrial space when I made that painting. Um, I think the more I've thought and looked at my work and watched the things that I like to look at, the, um, I, I, the more I've felt kind of grounded in my ancestry. It seems yeah. important to me what the people who came before me and my family lineage did. And I, I feel like I have like a psychic or DNA connection to them that I kind of can't can't shake so that's really fascinating do you think that the sort of subconscious um absorption of i mean you're making this work and it sort of evolves into something mm -hmm. and you can tell that you're very intuitive mm -hmm. in terms mm -hmm. of the way that you work there's mm -hmm. a kind of like looseness mm -hmm. to it 
there's this energy where it's almost like painting before you can think. Mm -hmm. Totally. Um, and I think that that's really intriguing about the work and mm -hmm. also just pleasurable about mm -hmm. looking at your work. So do you think that these ideas about industry, these ideas about your connection to it through your family, do they come out of the work revealing that history? Or is it that something happened where it became an interest to you personally yeah. as a person yeah. outside of art and then it sort of wended its way into the art? Yeah, I think, I mean, this is the wonderful thing of being an artist and our wonderful calling, which is in a way so self-absorbed. You get to think about yourself all the time and kind of wonder why you do the things you do and why you're interested in the things you're interested in. And I think, you know, I have, this is something I've, I've always, um, I've grown up, I've lived in Connecticut for my whole life. I went yeah. to college here. I went to grad school here. I've lived in New York for a little while. I came back to Connecticut. You know, my family has been here for three generations, um, I, which is unusual in my field. Most academics and artists in the urban areas haven't necessarily had this kind of relationship to, to yeah. long term that I have. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, Connecticut is a really fascinating state because of the, I, I think, in terms of class, because there are so many different kinds of areas in Connecticut. There's mm -hmm. the Gold Coast, there's, there are the kind of cities, mm -hmm. there's the rural areas in the east where my mother's from, and then in the west, which is sort of New York weekend. So I guess I've, I grew up interested in this, in these class dynamics, my, um, and thinking about like what it means to be working class, what it means to be owning class. Yeah. Um, my, my dad was a capitalist. You know, his dad was the vice president of the first union in Connecticut. I grew up listening to the two of them fighting each other about unions. <laughs> you know, they would right. just have like these endless fights. Whoa, um, that's kind of interesting. interesting yeah, yeah. And of course, my, I grew up a wealthy kid in Greenwich. My childhood was like solidly in the kind of investment banking overflow mm -hmm. that is that was Greenwich at that time. But I just, it's something that I've always been really interested in and kind of like tried to wrap my head around and figure out. So you could say that's really separate from my painting. And yet mm -hmm. I think my um, my painting reflects my sense that I'm a maker, that I'm like, a, I'm interested in working with hands. There's a kind of like directness to the work. There's um, uh, maybe a sense of of effort, of labor. I mean, there's the scale of them, the idea of repetition and turning that, you know, if you think of someone laboring with their bodies or hands, mm -hmm. there's doing the same thing over and over again. There's a kind of, um, there's a, a struggle and a, and, a, and a mundane quality to that, but there's also a, a spiritual quality to that, like yeah. a, a, um, a kind of potential for a sort of transcendent experience that is in that, that making and doing and repeating. Um, so I think all those things are in my work now. Um, yeah. When I first left college, I worked as a decorative painter um, so I had another experience of being a maker in these very wealthy people's houses. Mm. And that was kind of a, another take or another series of experiences that I think have influenced the work that I'm doing now. Tell me about the wealthy people's house. What was that? When what I was a decorative you? painter? Yeah. What was that? So you would paint people's houses? So yeah, so we would Images be, of people's no, houses. No, no, no. So work. I was brought into, I was, I worked for this awesome uh, woman named Nancy Barnett in Burlington. And she was, we had a Four people were, were in her company, and yeah. we were hired by people all over the Northeast um, to create kind of murals or trompe l'oeil things yeah. or wall finishes, which is my favorite. And so you would enter, anyone ever, you know, you enter someone's home and you kind of camp out there and live there for the duration <laughs> of the project and have this really intimate relationship with their space. That's crazy. You know, and yet you're like the hired help. So and I mean, some people are incredibly lovely and gracious and become yeah. your good friends. And then yeah, other yeah. people don't let you use the bathroom, which is super right. weird. Wow, that is so, really weird. Um, yeah. It's interesting. I, but I loved the, I, I always felt a little bit like this covert agent, like sneaking into people's houses and yeah, having this intimacy with them was an interesting experience for me. Yeah, that sounds really interesting. Um, I want to talk about the mandala paintings mm -hmm. a lot, but... Um, I was really interested because I was looking at them and I was thinking about them actually as small paintings when I looked online and then I looked at the dimensions. They're really large. Yeah. But you kind of started making them at a smaller scale, right? I tend to work either at a very small scale or a very large scale. Yeah. Um, 
right now I'm working, I'm, I'm in the studio today or yesterday, I, I make these little, no more, no larger than eight by eight inch gouache paintings. Yeah. And then I also make these paintings, which the, the most recent is seven and a half by seven and a half feet. And it feels like they could be even larger. So right. yeah, I feel like I'm pretty comfortable at these very opposite ends of scale. When I so when I was looking at them though, because of this dropping the shadow, which is really interesting, because mm -hmm. they're sort of they're these abstract designs, but then they start to feel like they're objects. Yeah. At the same time, and I yeah. I love that in between space yeah, yeah. in the paintings. Yeah. And I had this weird association. I looked at them and I started thinking of the artist Josephine Halverson's mm -hmm. work, and it's interesting because she paints a lot of industrial mm -hmm. stuff, you know, yeah. and it's kind of in a trompe loy yeah. place. So I made all these connections like, oh, you're, you're a trompe, you know, you were yeah. a trompe loy painter. Yeah. You're thinking about industry and, and kind of machinery in industry. That's so interesting. And then I sort of had this association. I didn't know why I was having the association exactly. That's so interesting. So yeah. I love trompe loy for so yeah. many reasons. I mean, first of all, in the Western tradition, it's sort of the earliest painting that was written about. Plato writes about Trump, the Trump Loy painting that he's seeing around him. And of course, he hates it. He In The Republic, he talks about how it's like, it's trickery. It's keeping people from the truth. Painters should be kicked out of the Republic. You know, so there's this, but that idea of painting as mimesis is something that in the Western critical tradition, people have pushed against and accepted and you know, there's some great articles about how um, Susan Sontag writes about how just the idea that a painting has to have some kind of relationship to content that was mm -hmm. sort of set up by Plato is still dogging us now. We can't just right. experience it as a kind of visceral thing. Right. We have to say, what does it mean? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And so I think I, th I, I love that Trump Loy has that history. I love that it's also in early American painting. It's sort of like there's this whole early American Trump Loy thing, which is sort of this mm -hmm. naive, the beginnings of America establishing itself as a cultural, a place where culture happens. Right. Um, but it's like super hokey when yeah. people start doing it. There in, are a lot of really bad. Yes, yeah, super American bad paintings. early American paintings, but they're really naive in yeah. this like really sweet way. Yeah. Um, you know, so. And then, it, and then I feel like it has this, this. It, so it's just like it's kind of cheesy. There's these great myths about Trompe L'oeil painting the, um, the the Zeuxes and I'm forgetting how to pronounce his name. The other Greek dude who had this fight, Xerxes, yeah, yeah, about painting, yeah. and they kind of one guy pulls aside the Trompe L'oeil curtain, but of course it's Trompe L'oeil, so he loses the contest, and that Apollo so like, you know, gives the gift to the other guy or something like that. So there's it's Trompe L'oeil has been wrapped up in painting history for a long time, and I think it's. That delight that we feel when you're tricked into thinking that something's three-dimensional when it's not. It's mm -hmm. like a very childlike experience and excitement. And I think really fundamental to, it's just a really fundamental part of what painting is. I think it's funny. I think it's serious. I think it's important. I think it's not yeah. important at all. Yeah. Um, and I, sometimes it feels like a big joke to me that like Trompe l'oeil, which I used to make fun of when I was a decorative painter, literally painting Trompe l'oeil dog coats on someone's entryway, you know, that Trump <laughs> has become central to my practice, you know, it That's keeps so me funny. kind of from taking myself too seriously. But at the same time, I think it it's actually a really important, Trump Loy is a really important kind of well, part of painting. Speaking of one of the ones that I love, I just want to pull it up on the computer. Hold on a second. I think it's called Om Halt. Mm -hmm. Where'd you get the title for that? I mean, I always struggle with my titles a little bit, and that's one that actually makes me slightly queasy. My favorite title is Lunch Flower, which is the one above. <laughs> I love that painting, too. And we'll, we'll, I think we should talk about that one, too. But this one, it interested me initially because when I looked at it, it looked like a Scottish plaid, almost. Yes. And so I was thinking, like, oh, most of them have more depth to mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. But then I started looking at this for a longer period of time and it started to have even more depth than <laughs> the other ones. It was weird. Like there's this like portal. Yeah, that's kind of cool. in the middle of of the painting. So I don't know. I just had this funny cool. like way, like taking time with it. That's cool. I mean, I love that idea of certainly love that idea of a portal, some kind of opening in consciousness. You know, I definitely play with the trompe l'oeil and it's not yeah. it's not precise. I mean, often it will contradict itself. So it's not like it's not actually real trompe l'oeil. It doesn't work if you look at it carefully, but it but the hint of it is there, which create which does create that illusion of space. And that painting is one which 
which did get flatter than some of the other. I think partly because those white bands across almost look like light or they look like a kind of light yeah. coming from the outside. Um, right now it is looking like a light. So yeah. it sort of has this wonderful shift of yeah. associations. Like you look at it at a different moment, it looks like this. Yeah. It looks like that. I mean, that is a big one of the reasons that I love painting is that it 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 has good painting is always ambiguous and it yeah. holds the space for your projections. And if it's a meaningful painting, then it then that space that it holds is really large and people can see it in all different ways and it changes over time. and It has that kind of richness of meaning. Yeah. To me, in terms of the kind of process that you use to to make these, when I look at these, there's this combination of they look planned, but they also look intuitive at the same time. Like yeah. it looks like in order to create those really interesting sort of trompe l'oeil layers to the abstract mm -hmm. shapes mm -hmm. that you're putting in there, it seems like you have to plan that. Mm -hmm. Like you can't just go in and just do that. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, there's the brush stroke, like rapid mm -hmm. brush stroke. How do you go about how what's what is it like for you? making those paintings? How, what's your process? So I think a lot about sports. Um, I was an athlete when I was young. I wasn't like a great athlete, but I um, did do tons of sports and yeah. particularly skating and ice hockey. And um, which was, but skating was a sport that I, I loved and, and I figure skating for a while. And um, I, you know, when you, when you're an athlete, you practice and you practice and you try something and then, and then you just sort of like execute and, and it's all intuitive, like mm -hmm. in the moment. And I think of painting very much the same way that you you know, you by working, you develop tricks or things you know that work or strategies. But then when you're actually making the painting, it you execute it. And it's mm -hmm. intuitive and it's scary and it's exciting. And yeah. you yeah. could mess it up. And there's a lot at risk. And, you know, all the ways that you feel when you're or you would imagine an athlete would feel when doing it when doing anything. That's such a great analogy. And it makes me think about um, sometimes I see this like behavioral therapist and he he works with athletes a uh -huh. lot and it's sort of it's all about kind of hypnosis sort of getting yourself into a state where mm -hmm. you know something well enough mm -hmm. that it feels like a sort of second nature to mm -hmm. you yeah like you work and plan so much on these paintings it sounds like that when you go you don't have to think about it which is exactly what you're talking about i guess with the sports analogy yeah i mean i think yeah. i for each individual painting, I have a rough idea of what I want it to be like. I yeah. have a starting place, and the starting place is usually another painting. You know, yeah. the either a small painting or a big painting. I'll be like, I kind of want it to look a little bit like that, so I'll right. know how to get started with the layers. But then inevitably, it sort of takes off at some point and goes down a different direction. Which is part of the sort of playful. Yeah, it wouldn't be of any fun. Like it took, and it took me a long time to figure that out. I used to think that I should have mapped out my painting and then do it, which I do for the long weavings. And I think for right now, that's why I've left those aside because mm -hmm. there's no room for like the magic to come in if you're just doing what you yeah. said you were going to do the whole time, you know, and in, in these, they always go off in these other directions. I think the other thing about these paintings and one reason that I really like making the really big ones is that they're so forgiving. There's no, I make mistakes constantly. I'll be mm -hmm. like, whoops, I thought I was going to put that yellow over there, but it's like, eh, it's okay. And literally they're so big that it's, it's like, it's fine. There's plenty of room for mistakes. And, you know, I think that in terms of the therapy part, just bringing that, which I, I think about painting is self-healing all the yeah. time. And, um, you know, it's sort of accepting myself and my, my inadequacies and like right. giving myself room for them and not trying to hide them or pretend they don't exist, but just be like, yeah, you know, I'm a person who makes a lot of mistakes. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, I noticed looking through these, I think it was something sun, maybe child child like son or i can't remember school son yeah that's yeah. what it's called yeah. school son and i was looking at that um and it was really funny because you set up this sort of symmetrical thing where everything's supposed to be symmetrical <laughs> but then everything's not quite symmetrical <laughs> and like the sort of inner um radius of the sun form like none of the points or like one of the points <laughs> right. matches up with everything, yes. with everything else. And then none of the other points <laughs> match up with the sort of outer sun form. And I just thought that was really funny. Yeah. And, that's, and fun. That's great. That's a yeah. good, great observation. I mean, that's always what happens. And literally yeah. like with counting, I'll be like, I'm going to have eight points. And then I'll start and I'll be like, whoops, I made nine. <laughs> you know, it's just constantly. Yeah. But it's, you know, that's the joy of it. That, and also yeah. I think that's the... 
like that's the healing part of it for me that like I can if I can make out of my mistakes a painting that that has a kind of vitality in mm -hmm. life, then, you know, then I can then it's OK for me to be myself and with all yeah. my foibles. And well, the, kind the of energy issues. really comes through. I mean, it really comes through in these wor these latest works. They have a kind of mm -hmm. like a presence. That's great. That, that grabs the eye like you can't not look at them. That's great. Like. And I think probably some of that is because of all the sort of spontaneity and self-acceptance or that has to go into. I mean, that's a real, that's, you know. that would, I would hope so. I mean, I have to say for me, mostly in my life, I mean, I'm 42, I'll be 43 yeah. this summer. Um, I've been painting seriously, you know, most on and off, but pretty seriously since I was in college. Um, and mostly it's been like not that fun and yeah. really hard. <laughs> yeah. And like, I, I've had a few moments where it's, I've been in the flow, but a lot of times it's felt like banging my head against a wall. And I've kind of wondered why I chose this as a career, but I, do, I have felt that, you know, as I've gotten older, maybe in the past few years that, that some things have opened up and I've, I've been able to just like really enjoy it and kind yeah, of feel, really uh, feel the flow. That's great. Yeah. You said, uh, I think it was some past interview that I was looking at that you sort of left painting for a while. And then when you were like 27, you were like, I, I got to do this again. Yeah. What happened? What happened in your head? So I am, um, I mean, I, I'll spare you the really long story, yeah. but I left painting. Um, I think because I wasn't very, I wasn't, wasn't very good at it. I mean, I was 21. I yeah. knew enough to know that I wasn't very good at it. It didn't come easily. Right. Um, I'm a bright person. I figured yeah. like, maybe I'll be better at something else. Yeah. So I just quit painting. And I, um, I did a lot of other things, but the one that really burned me out was I worked in marketing in New York. Um, I had a business partner and we had this viral marketing business during the early mm -hmm. days of the web. And I just, I one day found myself giving this like presentation about viral marketing to a, a pharmaceutical company and kind of like everything that was coming out of my mouth was bullshit. Like, <laughs> and I thought, and I, I just felt like, what am I, what am, who am I, what am I doing? You know? And I, yeah. um, I just, I just kind of, Basically, the, I quit. The business failed. I was like, it was a disaster. I lost all my money. I had like no nothing. I, and somehow that was like really freeing to me to having yeah. having had this like large flop that and then I sort of a start over. Yeah. And also moment. like a lot of freedom. Like I was OK. I mean, you yeah. know, the, the sky didn't fall. Like right. I, I, I had, you know, I went to Yale undergrad like I was I came from a family that, I mean, my family was, was great, but like I, I came from a culture that was very achievement oriented and I, um, I always sort of towed the line. And then in my late twenties, I just like, I was like, a, it was like a disaster by anyone's estimation. <laughs> so I, um, I went back to the Vermont studio center where I'd, I'd worked in development at some point during this journey, but not painted. And I, um, basically just asked them if I could just come and stay for a month and they had space to let me stay. That's great. And I had like no plans. I didn't, wasn't planning on making any paintings actually. I was so burnt out. I thought I would just like rest. And then I started painting again when I was up there, just little land, little square landscapes. Um, and that was just, um, it was just so exciting. It was great. And then I came back to New York you know, moved in with a friend, paid two hundred eighty dollars a month rent in Sunset Park, and um, started painting these cityscapes on this on the streets and that all square. And then that was um, the work that got me into grad school. And then I went to grad school and went That's on awesome. from there. So wow. Um, so you were just going out into the street with like a tiny yeah, canvas. Yeah, I and was doing it in and plein air painting. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I mean, it was like in a way, I was super naive. I wasn't particularly engaged with the art world in New York at the time. Yeah. But I, um, yeah, I would just like put my little Van Gogh backpack on and get on the subway and go to Far Rockaway or, you know, I had like That's a little so spot cool. in Grand Central and um, yeah. I um, I would go out. I mean, I, I lived so cheaply. I worked part time at a kid's summer camp on the Upper East Side and then, um, and then make two or three paintings a week. Um, and they all had to be done in one sitting. And um, yeah, they were, they were all just like out on the streets. Um, so, I mean, it was really fun. It was like, it was fun. It was it was a great adventure. So you were sort of in that market of like people that stand outside museums and are like, "Hey, totally. I'll paint," you know. Totally. The that's so funny. That's I mean, such an interesting the only thing, thing that, to experience. The only thing that was different about I feel like about me was I was I never was able to paint like like I wasn't I was terrible at painting things that people like wanted. Like someone would be like, "Paint this landscape for me," and I couldn't do it. It was um a lot of it for me was the experience of of going outside, of exploring the city, of doing this 
what felt like a kind of, I mean, it's not like it's that, but it felt like an against the grain thing to be doing mm -hmm. in, at least compared to my, my prior life in New York City, you know. And I, that work got you into Yale. It did. That's amazing. <laughs> I, know. <laughs> I, know. I mean, I had, I have some funny stories because one, I would, there's just like green spot on this sort of off ramp to the BQE where I would sit and paint this parking lot below yeah. me. And um, it was my one of my favorite spots. And so I just love painting all those cars, you yeah, know, so I, yeah, I yeah. a lot of it was developing my affections, figuring out what stuff I like to look at. And it right. turns out the stuff I like to look at is was pretty industrial, actually. Yeah, and yeah, that yeah, um, yeah. those were the places I ended up finding myself making these cars and, you know, weird industrial that wastelands awesome. and kind of just weird stuff in Brooklyn. <laughs> so when did you like, was it that going through the Yale um, grad school experience that moved you into abstraction? Like what? Yeah. What I mean, I, you into yes. I mean, at Yale, I came, I tried to do what I'd been doing. It didn't, it sort of just like, I lost the drive to do it. And then I mm -hmm. just kind of like floundered and flopped around for two years, basically. Um, I would say at the end of my time at Yale, um, I started painting kind of these images that were a little bit from my dreams because um, it felt like at least I could, because I, I, I could, I, I'd been involved in this sort of archetypal dream work kind of mm -hmm. therapy for my whole life, or since I was you know, the past 25 years. And yeah. so when I was in grad school, I felt like maybe I would start there because at least it was a, a juicy place, something. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I made these like really awful figurative paintings for my dreams. And then, and then they became a little simpler. And then actually the painting that my favorite painting from grad school is this big star painting, um, which which initially was from this painting of a monster blocking out the light of with the five, the five points of the star were like the, the limbs of the monster, but it turned into a it turned into just this black star and in, in, in front of a painting. And it's really f wild for me to see that star painting now and think now about my star paintings and right. see this connection yeah, between the two. Yeah, that's fascinating. And now you're painting like the sun, which yeah, is a star. Yeah, right? I know. Or yeah. like the, like the or, darkness has been pulled away, and now I'm painting like this bright inside or. Something. Yeah. But um, I often, I mean, one of the things I love about painting is I feel like, you know, that image is primary. All of my ideas about the meaning of that image are sort of have come and gone and shifted over all of these years. But there's something about that image, which obviously is part of my, like, which imprint. Is, <laughs> right. It, um, and it's fascinating. It's fascinating to sort of be able to sort of think about them. I mean, they could be, they could be anything. I mean, I think getting that, like, star thing is pretty fundamental to them. But but connecting it to sort of factories and industry and like tools of industry is also really interesting to me. Mm -hmm. Like, what do you see as an artist? Like, what are they? If like, or what could they be? Yeah. It's not I mean, what are they, but. You know, I, I went to visit a factory that one of my former, that a, a contact of mine through Hartford, he actually wasn't a student of mine, although he was a student there, um, that he was working at. And he posted a picture of the factory on Instagram. And I was like, yeah. oh my God, I just, like, I have to see that place. That's exactly what I want to look at. And I think it reminded me of those cars that I used to yeah, paint yeah. the cityscapes of years ago. Yeah. And um, I mean, I, I think I find like the regularity of the forms, like the kind of the hopefulness of industry, like mm -hmm. of mechanical industry, like the idea that mm -hmm. you could make something to change our world. To, but But there's also like a, like a, I, I like the paint. I mean, I I like I imagine I think of the paintings as as um, ambiguous. Sometimes light and sometimes dark. You know, there's right. the, that would be the bright side. The dark side is the kind of the prison of of the of the factory of the factory yeah. line. Um, the prison of the you know. I think sometimes they look a little bit like um, those Catherine wheels that medieval torture device, right. you know, or just I think about them, which I'm I'm as important to me because my name Catherine is spelled with an A and. St. Catherine's name was also spelled with an A. Nice. And um, so I feel the psychic connection to that's her. That's interesting. And that's her visual form. I, yeah, and I think they look a lot like um, radial engines, mm -hmm. which they look like. Uh, I, I'd love to see. The, there's like these radial engine gifs, which are pretty cool and make me think about my paintings. They have this. Yeah. And if you've ever seen them, they're strangely like sexy and mechanical yes. at the same time. They're super weird. I have this association when I look at them. They they remind me a little bit of like futurist painting because there's that energy and motion minus the sort of misogynistic and <laughs> <Right>. fascist <laughs> underpinnings of the futurist. But yeah, 
do you do you yeah. look at their work and I mean think I about them? I I do think about them. I um I mean I think about the good the good and the bad there, yeah. right? The excitement, yeah. the the youth, the energy, the vitality, and then like hope, a lot of hope right, the, the for, hope, yeah. the kind of all the possibility, and then of course, yeah, the misogyny and the fascism and the darkness and the yeah. kind of um, all the things that get trampled in that making. I mean, I I think certainly that when you look at feminist work, that the central core form, obviously, you know, I grew up at a time when every I grew up with a bunch of teachers who really loved to make fun of Judy Chicago. <laughs> um, that was sort of That's like the thing to do. Right. And I think I kind of took it on until maybe ten years afterwards. Like, wait a second, she was awesome, and right. this is actually awesome. And the reason they were making fun of her was because it was awesome. <laughs> and, right. And they wanted to take down. And they wanted to take down, work. right, this, 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 th- these ideas and this work. And yeah. so I, f- I think about that in my work too, um, mm-hmm. about, about using a vaginal central mm-hmm. form. Um, yeah. I and see that. I think, I mean, in terms of the family history stuff, particularly, I do just think a lot about these women in my family who yeah. were working in the factories, you know, having babies, doing all these, all these things. Um, one of the things that I thought about when I was looking at these mandala slash uh, industrial slash star forms, when I was thinking about them in the context of futurism, I thought, and I was thinking about your family history mm-hmm. in factories, um, I thought about the fact that a lot of, except for super abstract futurism, that most futurist paintings are from like the third person, like hmm. you're look, you're away from it. Huh. And I was thinking about these paintings as like somebody with their face like right in a machine, you know, like working close up to that's a machine. That's really cool. That's really interesting. Yeah, no, that's really cool. I mean, I often turn them when I make them. I noticed the drip marks. Yeah. Uh, some of them are you know, like going off to the side. So. <laughs> yeah. And it's been, I mean, that I think has been important to me for all these reasons. Like it makes me feel like I'm actually in a factory, like working and turning mm-hmm. something. It makes me, I like the way it kind of height, it heightens the sense of energy. I also like the way there's a relationship maybe to a, like a psychic process that we all go through when you're like, let's look at this from a different way. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. When you get like really down some rabbit hole with your anxiety, yeah. you're like, let's just yeah, yeah, turn yeah. the situation around yeah, and reconsider yeah. it from this other direction. <laughs> totally. And I feel like that's what I do when I switch the paintings. I practice that mental process. You would think because they're radial that they'd be really easy to compose, that they would look good from all directions, but that's totally not true. And every time I turn them, I have to reimagine the composition and Kind of right. because gravity is such a huge force in, yeah. in a painting's presence. Um, and I found that by turning them somehow, I mean, I always have to reconsider that, but it, it seems to make give them more energy and fo- give them bring the energy like kind of like fight gravity a little bit. More. Yeah. In your artist statement, you mentioned centripetal force. Yeah. And yeah. You're kind of doing that in a way by turning them, right? Yeah. Like you're fighting gravity and centering the energy around the sort of central point of the painting. Yeah. And yes. And yet, like, when I flip it, I have to reconcile it for that particular position. Like, I, it's clear to me that they're meant to be looked at vertically. But yeah. but I find that when I can keep turning them and keep changing the orientation that needs to be right, that they, right, they gather, kind of gather more energy. Um and it feels it. I almost do. I really. I mean, it's. I imagine that physical feeling of yeah, being on like a spinning carousel or whatever, and feeling your yeah. body being pulled out and needing to hold to the center. Yeah, and you also mentioned carnival wheels and stuff as being an influence. Where's that? Where does that come from? Well, I, my kids like think they look like fans or carnival wheels. <laughs> <laughs> so but you I, have to go with what your kids. Of right? course, like, of course. But I think yeah. that you know, like I think that's in there too. The idea mm-hmm. of like of scary fun <laughs> yeah <laughs> of, definitely. Um, of that yeah something that's like really fun but also kind of freaks you out totally and your painting process is so important to you and like color seems so yeah. important to you and i just from watching that last that interview with gorky's granddaughter it was clear to me that color was really important and that you know you get your pigments at a special place and you're thinking about again back to these early paintings of automobiles in new york Mm -hmm. thinking about like color Mm -hmm. from automobiles Mm -hmm. and using pigments maybe that potentially are used yeah in the auto industry yeah i mean you know i didn't i was always people often saying when you teach painting people often talk about how they're sort of their value painters and color painters and Mm -hmm. 
people who prioritize value in painting and then people who prioritize color. And if you look at it, an artist like Van Gogh, you see like when that switched in his life. It's really cool. I think yeah. often students tend to think in black and white and then there might then there's a moment when color just happens. It's not always the case. Some students come in just being great with color and but for me, like I I was really like a value painter until in my thirties when I had a major health crisis and then I don't know, something shifted and I started to really work with color and um yeah, I mean that is like the joy of it f- yeah. for me. Those the color relationships that you can create. I mean, I work with a Gera paint system now, so I I mix all my paints. Um, I use p- pigment dispersions, and Gera has like. Can you explain that? Because I actually have no idea. Oh yeah, what okay. That is, so cause... so Gera is a company in New York, and they sell uh, pigment dispersions, which is just the powdered pigment but mixed into water. Yeah. So it makes it a little safer to work with. Got um, it. And so you can buy the pigment dispersions and then also the these different mediums to mix the binders to mix okay. the pigment into. So instead of you're getting a tube of paint, which has them already mixed together, you kind of you make your it. own um, binder. That's and cool. then And so what I like to do, I use like a particular formulation. I mean, I mix up their stuff to make um, something which is, it's kind of like a little drippier than house paint. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I mix all my pigments into that. So I get this particular kind of paint that I can make. Mm. Um, but, you know, some pigments are transparent by nature, some are opaque. And then Gera is a company that has done tons of work getting this vast array of pigments. And yeah, a lot of them were developed for the autom- the automotive industry. I, I have no idea where they get them, but sort of like this amazing collection of different pigments, each which has its own transparency and light fastness and everything else. So um, mixability. So it's just like having a, you know, having a real relationship with all of these, these items to create th- these pigments. But I, yeah. I end up with like with I just constantly mix little containers of paint um, and then that are usually very drippy. And then and then I'll use them to make the paintings. That's so cool. So there is you I mean, you're working with acrylic, but there's still this kind of relationship to like old master painters that are like mixing pigments and yeah. kind yeah. of have a little laboratory. That yeah. They're working in yeah, it's definitely in very like lab like um Although sloppy lab, because that's sloppy what I'm like. <laughs> yeah. But you, it, it it does show that there is this very particular consistency to the paint. Because on one level, they're very painterly. Like they're sort of thick and you can kind of see the brush stroke and the gesture. But they're also drippy, right? Yeah. Like there's like a looseness to the paint and a kind of thickness. Or you must have a very particular like yeah. I mean, it thickness comes- that you they're almost they, all painted with um, house painting brushes. I mean, this all comes out of my work as decorative yeah, painter. They're, yeah. Because those are my tools, the, pa- the house paint and the house painting brushes and um, the kind of gesture I could get with them and the, you know, the consistency and the, and the, the, of the paint. And But yeah, I just make them just a little bit drippier because you don't want house paint to drip and I kind of want these to drip a little bit. Right. I also wanted to ask you just, you have an interest in the mandala form. Is mm-hmm. that something that kind of arose out of the paintings or was that something that you were interested in before the paintings? I mean, it's so funny because it's like very obvious that they look like mandalas or yeah. Eastern forms, t- tantric yeah. painting. Um, but I, I didn't get to that form through that route. Um, right. I I certainly am interested in Eastern philosophy and religion and always have been in the, the idea of the importance of the quiet mind, the sense that consciousness can shift through that quieting of the mind. Yeah. I'm very influenced by Agnes Martin as an artist who, even though I don't know if she explicitly talks about her, her relationship to Buddhism, but the way she talks about art is very Buddhist. It's, mm-hmm. you know, this idea mm-hmm. of kind of calming your mind and mm-hmm. letting an authentic presence arise. Um, so I, I feel a kinship with many of those ideas. And yet I never set out to paint a mandala or an Eastern like form. I just kind of it happens. arrived at that yeah. form and then said, oh, well, look at yeah. that resemblance, you know, and it makes sense. I mean, it helps me understand the mandala form maybe more broadly and right. as it's meant to be understood. Right. There are a lot of different associations. There's sort of an interior, exterior, like sort of the interior mind relating to the external yeah. world. Yeah. And I mean, I might be wrong. I was just kind of looking yeah. at it on Wikipedia yeah. a little bit. But then there are all these other associations as well, mm-hmm. um, which is cool because it's so broad. What was the transition from the weaving paintings or, or, you know, your abstract paintings that were 
loosely, some of them more directly gesturing towards weaving or what happened in between that Mm -hmm. period and the mandala? Like, how did you come to it? How did you discover it? Yeah. So I've often made the central form paintings like alongside the weaving ones. Um, The older ones, which I was making around that time of that Gorky's granddaughter interview, like in 2010, took me forever. And I felt like they were I learned about I learned a lot about color through them, but Mm -hmm. they would take me months and months and be just like very tedious to Mm -hmm. create. Actually, even though they didn't look tedious in the end, but they Mm -hmm. felt tedious while I made them. I mean, they may have looked tedious a certain way, but they didn't look neat, I guess is what I'm saying. (laughs) But you're Um, repeating a gesture over and over and over again. Trying to get the color right, basically. And so I would just keep painting over them and over them and over them. And then they would look really muddy and gunky in the end. But they kind of had this color that I was after. And I think... um, before I had my first child, I um, so this was in 2012, the summer before mm-hmm. my first child was born, I, I started painting the weavings again, but in a more open, quicker, more fun way. Then I had my two kids kind of in succession and mm-hmm. didn't get a ton done in the studio during those early years. And then when I came back, I felt ready to, I don't know, just take on that circle form again, but with the same kind of energy and spontaneity that I've been doing the weavings with. Yeah. Um, and I, I think there was some part of me that had always been saying, oh, you can't just sit around and paint circles. Like, it's so boring. How can you paint? Like, you can't just paint a radial form over and over and over again. And then I think I'm like, actually, maybe I could for the rest of my <laughs> life. <laughs> yeah. Maybe that would be just fine, actually. I think maybe getting older and realizing, I mean, thinking about limiting, Mm -hmm. limiting my practice rather than expanding it and how much deeper and more engaging it might get if I narrow the boundaries. And Um, it's so exciting to see the possibilities within the narrowed boundaries, because even within those narrow boundaries, there are so many, I mean, almost an infinite number of variations of that form that you can make. Totally. And I, and as I've committed to it, it feels like so huge to me, like so many possibilities, you know, yeah, almost too large, way too large. Um, But it's, I think it's, it's also, it's comforting. I mean, these are the, I feel like the gifts of midlife (laughs) that you have a a sense of the finiteness of your life. I mean, mortality is something that has always been important to me. I've done some projects around this idea of death. And, you know, I think that limit that we all have on our experience and our Mm -hmm. consciousness really accepting that and working with that has yeah. been freeing. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm i getting there. I, I am sort of getting to that point, but myself and it's... I mean, I think every artist probably approaches it really differently, but but for, but yeah, but for, or like has a different outcome from it. But for me, I don't know. I realize like I don't have that much time on this earth. Like, yeah. let me try to do one thing well. <laughs> right. <laughs> Instead right. of like a million things not that well. One other thing that was interesting to me uh, that I saw that you talked about, and I think you were talking about it in the context of the weaving patterns, but you talked about creating a world, you know, and I think that relates partially to, you know, you're working in a way like totally abstractly, but then you're, we were talking about earlier, you use that drop shadow, which starts to make the viewer think like, is this an actual thing? Mm-hmm. Is this an actual place? Mm-hmm. You know, because your brush strokes are casting shadows. Yeah. Is, is this is this an environment that you're creating? Do you want people to kind of feel like they're... That's such a cool question. Because I think, I mean, yes, but it's not like a material physical environment. I think mm-hmm. it's like a, you know, it's a it's a spiritual one. It's a non-material one. It's an alternate reality that coexists with the one that we think of as real. I mean, when I was looking at my paintings, like maybe five years ago, I noticed this isn't so much true now, but at the time they had, they had seemed to have this kind of blue, cool light. Mm -hmm. And I was remembering how much I love Tiepolo, um, who often paints those ceiling, you know, there's like nothing about my paintings or anything like Tiepolo, except that he was a decorative painter. (laughs) And he, he often painted these, um, these, um, apotheosis paintings yeah. like where you know they were like the ceilings of rooms and you would it was about like just sort of leaving the room and ascending and into heaven into yeah. Space, yeah going into the ether and mm-hmm. his work all of his work has this kind of like otherworldly blue light mm. and and that appeals to me like this idea of of a painting as a liminal space a liminal uh object that sort of somehow mediates the these two worlds this this supernatural divine and then this like physically material and present um and that it might be a portal or a doorway or you know that some kind of apotheosis could happen in front of it (laughs) that's really interesting 
do you have in these paintings that are mandala like or sun like you know there is a lot of variation can you walk me through how for instance let's let's actually look at a specific sure. one let's look at orange grill like but how do you develop a pattern and i mean so this this one came from i'm pretty sure i don't totally remember but it it came from a smaller gouache painting mm -hmm. um so from that painting i knew that that background which is like kind of a it's this particular kind of transparent blue you yeah. know, it's like a wash. I'm like, okay, so I put that wash down first. And then, you know, the first 10 or so steps come from that wash. So I'll say, and yeah. then I'll look at the wash and be like, oh, what does it look like I did next? Oh, it looks like I put that, you know, light yellow border around the edge. Okay, I'll do that. Um, okay, it looks like I put those orange bands there. Okay, well, then I'll do that. Um, but inevitably what happens is I make those mistakes. I don't line up. I think I'm going to do right. six points and I do five. Right, I, right, right. I think I made the border the right width, but actually I made it way too wide or way too narrow. And so I end up having to improvise like pretty quickly. I would say yeah. after about five steps, I'm starting to compensate for so the mistakes that I made. Um, and then there's usually a moment, at least in these more recent ones, where you have so many more options for the scale of the brush when you're working at that large scale. So, you know, I just kind of follow my instincts. I mean, it's funny mm -hmm. how so much of it comes from early landscape painting that I did, because I remember a teacher saying this to me, but when you're learning to be a plein air painter, you are kind of training yourself to just be this receiver. You know, you 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 perceive whatever you're looking at and then you respond to it and you kind of train your hand to respond to what you're perceiving um, mm -hmm. without a lot of mediation from your mind. And now I think the, the painting is the motif for me now. So I paint from the painting. So I just respond to the painting. I perceive the painting and I respond to it. You know, and there's a, um, a maybe that at first is I look at the little one to get to the big one. Then all of a sudden I'm just looking at the big one and I'm just like the painting mm -hmm. tells me what to do, <laughs> you know. So cool. um, and then I think the... The tricky thing is that you can't think too far ahead is you, I, I only get one step at a time. So I find often that I'm challenged to just like stay in the step of the painting rather than try to imagine where it's going to turn out, um, but just do the thing that I think I'm supposed to do next, um, which is a lot like life. Totally. Know? It is a lot like life. <laughs> it was so great to learn about your practice in more detail and, you know. Thanks for having me. It was my pleasure. You can follow Kat on Instagram at Kat Balco. Remember to subscribe to us on iTunes. If you like the show, give us a good rating. And if you have a moment, write a review. Thanks for listening. Special thanks to Bruce Barber, director of WNHU, for providing the resources and guidance to make this podcast possible.